Hello, this is a revision video on Eden Rock by Charles Causley. As ever with any of these revision videos, they're not intended to supplement any notes you've done in class or any of your own ideas. They're just a few basic pointers following a reading of the poem. So Eden Rock by Charles Causley. They are waiting for me somewhere beyond Eden Rock. My father, 25, in the same suit of genuine Irish tweed, his terrier Jack, still two years old and trembling at his feet. My mother, 23, in a sprigged dress, drawn at the waist, ribbon in her straw hat, has spread the stiff white cloth over the grass. Her hair, the colour of wheat, takes on the light. She pours tea from a thermos, the milk straight from an old HB sauce bottle, a screw of paper for a cork, slowly sets out the same three plates, the tin cups painted blue. The sky whitens as if lit by three suns, my mother shades her eyes and looks my way over the drifted stream. My father spins a stone along the water, leisurely. They beckon to me from the other bank. I hear them call. See where the stream path is. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. I had not thought that it would be like this. So essentially this poem... Um, has a narrator who is recounting what seems to be a childhood memory that he has of his parents and a picnic. The parents are separated from the speaker by a stream, which represents crossing into the afterlife. Contextually, Causley was born in Cornwall in 1917. He left school at 15. Um, his father died from complications when he was about six or seven in 1924, with his lungs um, the complications were with his lungs following his service in the First World War. Causley himself served in the Navy as a coder in the Second World War, but he also worked as a teacher and a radio presenter when the war was not on. Causley wrote poetry for both children and adults, and it's sometimes difficult to tell the difference between the poems that he wrote for children and the poems that he wrote for adults, because they often have a similar style and quite simple language. Causley also frequently makes use of spiritual references in his poetry, and he frequently draws upon Cornish folk tales in his poetry. So interestingly, the title of the poem, Eden Rock, um, Causley himself said that it wasn't actually a, a real place. He made it up um, in an interview, which you can see on the poetry archive where he reads the poem. He also says at the end that he says, I don't know where it is. It's probably somewhere in Dartmoor. That's usually a safe answer. But essentially, it's a, it's a fictional place where he sets the poem and where the title comes from. Eden uh, has connotations of paradise, bliss, safety, um, God through the Garden of Eden, and rock in turn has the idea of a solid foundation, but it's also some, something impen impenetrable, something strong. In the first stanza, and indeed it continues throughout the poem, you can see um, that the poem is in present tense. Um, they, they are waiting for me somewhere beyond Eden Rock, um, which lends a strange quality to it because you're not sure whether it's a memory or it's in his imagination or it's a blurring of, of both, really. Um, the first line also creates questions that need to be answered. Who's waiting for him? Um, where is Eden Rock? And is this somewhere beyond? Does it mean somewhere beyond in terms of time or space? And that's where you get the first indication of the of the afterlife and the idea of this surreal sense from the poem. Time has stopped in this poem. So his father remains 25, his mother remains 23 and the dog remains two years old. And so time really has frozen. And these small details indicate a well-developed memory or an imagination of a really vivid scene. But the idea of um, later in the poem of the paper cork inside the bottle and these really um, sharp and precise details about what the parents are wearing really lends this a, a lifelike vivid quality. First stanza describes the father principally and the second stanza moves on to describe the mother and you've got images of purity in there as well with the stiff white cloth um, and the idea of uh, her hair taking on the light which seems quite angelic. There does seem to be throughout the poem a sense of familiarity that words like in the same suit of genuine Irish tweed um, and the stiff white cloth as opposed to a stiff white cloth. There's a sense of familiarity. There's a sense that this is something he's seen before, which is why many interpretations suggest that this is a, a childhood memory for Causley.
In the next two stanzas, uh, it continues with the present tense. The mother is pouring tea from a thermos. It's not something she did in the memory. It's something she's doing now. Um, and you've got the grounding, touching qualities um, that I really like in this poem. So the idea of um, there's nothing elevated about the picnic. They've got a paper, a bit of paper for a cork. Um, you've got the same three plates. Um, and it reiterates that they're waiting for him, the idea that they're setting an extra place for him in their picnic. I think there's a shift in tone between the third and the fourth stanza. And this part has been compared to what is generally believed to be seen when you're dying. So the idea of a bright light, the idea of moving towards that light. And this is where the sky whitens um, with that simile as if it's lit by three suns. And that could represent the Holy Trinity or or it could represent um, his family unit, his mother, his father and himself. At this point in the poem, the mother is looking for him by shading her eyes. She's looking towards him over the drifted stream. I think that's a really lovely um, set of words, really, drifted stream. The idea, actually, that it's usually clouds that drift or it's little pieces of wood down a stream. So it's a very gentle, soothing, languid and tranquil scene that's created. The father is spinning a stone. They don't seem to be in any rush. Um, but the stone does imply this separation and the drifted stream as well. They are physically separate from him. I really enjoy the enjambment between stanza four and stanza five. I think it really contributes to a relaxed pace, creates a caesura. It's really languid and tranquil. They beckon to me from the other bank. I hear them call, see where the stream path is. Um, I like the enthusiasm uh, denoted by the exclamation mark and the idea that they want him to join them. It's almost a sort of comforting idea about what death could be like. Um, there's mythical rivers. So this is something that's not new in literature, but it seems as if it's almost perhaps like the river Styx in Greek mythology or the Elysian fields or even Eden itself is said to be bordered by four rivers. I had not thought that it would be like this. So either you can write about this line being a sixth stanza in one line. I think it's more likely that you can see it as the fifth stanza of four lines, but there's a, a line break between the third line and the fourth line in this stanza. And that indicates the separation from his parents and where he is now. Um, and it, this line, I think, is, is brilliant. It's, it's monosyllabic, so it's very simple language. Um, and there's a real ambiguity, ambiguity to it. Um, leaving you to question what did he think was going to be different um, and it's a real final mystery to the poem which I think is really um, heartfelt succinct appropriate given that none of us know what death is going to be like and I think this is a really lovely poem it feels quite tender it feels quite intimate with the moment of the family um, and that last line I think is really thought-provoking in the form and structure in general you've got the half rhymes lending a natural rhythm and full rhymes would perhaps feel too jovial um, and they'd maybe to be too jolly and too unified for this. Um, the first person present tense lends an immediacy to the poem and it allows the reader to experience it as the narrator is um, articulating the scene. Thank you very much.